Hey friends, Gil here with what has become your weekly trigger warning. This conversation includes discussions of suicidal ideation and dermatillomania, which is skin picking, and it might be disturbing to some. His name is Gil, and he's mentally ill. That's why the name of the show is Mentally Ill. Mm -hmm. My name is Gil Kruger, and on this show, I go deep with content creators on their struggles with mental health. On this season of Mentally Gill, we're focusing on anxiety and burnout. This week, my friend Natasha Negavanlis enters the chat. We talk about her journey to a diagnosis, her skin picking disorder, and social anxiety. Hi, I'm Natasha Negavanlis. I'm an actor, writer, occasional producer, content creator, a recovering opera singer, and a pal of Gill. Natasha grew up in a working-class neighborhood in Toronto, the daughter of a custodian father and an executive assistant mother. She says that growing up, there was always an underlying anxiety, only she couldn't quite verbalize what she was feeling. There were many times throughout my youth where I knew I needed help, and I knew I needed to speak to someone, and I wanted to. And I remember talking to my parents about that. I remember speaking to teachers about that. But also, there wasn't a lot of conversation or language around mental health. So it was very much seen as something you do if there's a a crisis. And at that time, because I was doing so well in school and I was very high performing and high functioning, people thought I was okay. People only looked at mental health care as something necessary for someone who's maybe flunking out of school, who's messing up their life, you know, a teen who's getting into trouble. And it was like, I wasn't getting into trouble. I was getting straight A's. I was part of so many societies and clubs and extracurriculars. And so it was like, oh, she has it all together. When inside, you know, I think I was really a mess. And I think it manifested in a physical way to the point where I had such extreme migraines in high school that I was labeled as having a disability, a severe disability. I would be terribly, terribly ill. I wouldn't get a cold or have the flu or anything like that. It would be just horrible migraines. Her parents tried to figure out what was wrong, and Natasha went on a journey of meeting with various doctors. I eventually had to see one of the top neurologists in Canada. They gave me preventative medication, and some of it is, you know, hormonal. Some of it was hereditary. You know, my father had migraines as well. So there is a medical aspect to it, but I do really believe that a lot of it could have been treated psychologically. At first, Natasha's migraines hit when she least expected them. She'd make it through a week of school, and then the pain would come on a weekend or holiday. Eventually, she realized that one of her migraine triggers was tension release. I'd be in class, and it would be like right after a test, and all of a sudden, I'd get the aura. So what happens is people with extreme migraines, you get an aura, so you see flashing lights, little zigzag lines. Sometimes you lose your peripheral vision. It's like this fog sort of rolls in. Um, you get blind spots. So all of a sudden I'd be looking at the blackboard and there would be a big blind spot. And then it would be like, oh no, in about 20 minutes, I'm going to have excruciating pain and uncontrollably vomit. And I would just be so sick for like 24 to 48 hours. At times, Natasha's migraines would get so bad that she would end up in the hospital. It was to the point where like my vitals, doctors would say, was as if someone had just been in like a car accident and experienced extreme trauma. That's how bad my migraines were. And I definitely think that a lot of it could have been remedied. There's not enough conversation about how mental health affects physical health, I think. Natasha says that she sees a pattern of misdiagnosis that affects women much more than men. I do think for too long, women especially are misdiagnosed and not taken seriously by male psychiatrists. And a lot of that is that studies and research were not done on women. And it manifests very differently for cisgender women than it does uh, cisgender little boys. Boys get diagnosed right away. Women don't. And often it really shows and comes out in our late 20s and early 30s. But it appears to be a sense of failure or a sense of self-doubt or imposter syndrome. It's like, oh, I can't manage my time and I can't focus or I'm too hyperactive and I have too many projects on the go. And it's like, oh, well, if I struggle with that, then it's like I can't balance and I'm a 
bad person versus being like, no, there's, there's something else going on. In 2009, Natasha enrolled at the Schulich School of Music at McGill University in Montreal. Her major was voice performance, opera specifically. She moved out of her parents' house and into a dorm, and her anxiety moved in with her. I had a lot of anxiety in university and in my late teens, and I didn't really understand what that was. And I think a lot of it was around social pressures. You know, I was performing all the time and had to sing in front of my peers all the time. And that certainly piqued a lot of anxiety. And I remember having physical reactions to it sometimes. So either my mouth would get really, really dry, or it would be the opposite where I'd be in the middle of singing a piece, either early music or opera, classical music. And it would be the opposite where I'd almost have too much saliva that would start flowing to the point where I'd have to like swallow in the middle of a phrase as I was singing. And it would sound like I was, you know, kind of cacking or like breathing at the wrong spot. And then I think to counter that, my body then automatically was like, okay, don't let that happen. But then my mouth would get so dry that my diction wouldn't be super clear. And of course, I'm being quite harsh on myself. Like I I did very well in all my performance classes and it was probably not noticeable to the audience in any way or to my professors in any way. You know, I I, I was doing quite well in, in performance, but on the inside, I certainly felt like I was quote unquote failing in some way, I guess. Throughout university, Natasha would continue to be plagued by her migraines. She wanted to see a doctor and stayed on a wait list for two and a half years. She left school before she could get an evaluation. And then eventually I, I left school and I mostly left school to pursue my career in acting and because I was putting myself through school and I, I realized I did not want to be an opera singer and I was sort of throwing my, my money away. I started working in musical theater immediately after leaving school. Then the first time I saw a psychiatrist was uh, very early 2016, end of 2015. I had a very, very bad episode of suicidal ideation. uh, And this was not the first time that it happened. The first time it happened, I was about nine. My parents found some journals where I was, you know, talking about how I wanted to die. The second time was in my early, early 20s, probably around 21. Um, It was a pretty rough patch in my parents' marriage and just on my own as well. I I was couch surfing. I didn't have a place to live and it was uh, a tough time, Um, but I didn't do anything about it. I made it through it. And then, yeah, by 2016, it was to the point of crisis where like I was constantly being hospitalized for migraines and I broke down. It was the first time I had a full on panic attack, which I had never experienced before, that real sense of panic to the point where I was afraid to leave my apartment. I was afraid to even shower. It was truly a sense of fear. Like I would just start crying out of fear. And I was always a quite a fearless person. Eventually, Natasha realized that she needed help for her panic attacks and reached out to her family doctor, saying the words that had been so hard for her to muster. I need help. And I broke down in her office. And finally, uh, she referred me to our Center for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto. So the thing about healthcare here is you can't just pay for a shrink or pay for a psychiatrist. So you need a doctor referral in order to see an actual psychiatrist and deal with medications. At the time, I was just assigned a psychiatrist who, to his credit, he had only been in the country for six months and came from a country that doesn't have a lot of language around the LGBTQ community. And it's actually illegal. And so they weren't familiar. So I don't fault him. I I fault the center. He had actually asked me how to spell the word queer. (laughs) which was very uh, anxiety-inducing for me at that time because I was like, I'm crazy because I'm crazy, not because I have a girlfriend right now. That was very, very alarming. And then he misdiagnosed me with panic disorder. Now, panic disorder is when you have panic attacks about having another panic attack. At that time, I was certainly panicking, but they were panic attacks coming out of depression and anxiety. I didn't have panic disorder, but I had been prescribed an anxiety medication. I think it helped a little bit. They also suggested I was perhaps on the OCD spectrum. That checks out. I am. But I would still have the occasional panic attack. 
In 2014, Natasha's career began to take off when she was cast in the title role in a Canadian web series called Carmilla, a campy vampire soap set in college with a will-they-won't-they they lesbian romance. At its core, Carmilla developed a rabid fandom on Tumblr, and Natasha became a queer icon. Let's hear a clip. It is so beautiful, the way you try. What? To hell with light and casual. I wasn't the target audience for this, but representation matters. And a lesbian vampire web series sponsored by a tampon company really caught on. And yes, I know that last sentence sounded like Mad Libs, but that's the internet for you. Behind the scenes, though, Natasha was hurting and trying to figure out what her triggers were. One of her therapists wondered if it was her chosen profession of acting. Oddly enough, I had a terrible uh, psychiatrist who was just so dismissive and frankly quite bad at their job, I think, um, misdiagnosed me with a personality disorder this past summer. Um, and then, I, of course, I got a second opinion and, and, and then a third opinion, and both the second and third did not uh, believe that I had. But it, some things really struck me when he said, I wouldn't have chosen a career in acting and performance if I had social anxiety. And that was so ridiculous to me because I was like, well, this person's obviously never met an actor because so many actors, particularly screen actors, uh, which I, you know, I primarily am now, have great social anxiety. Acting is a way to, I think, safely act out situations or feel things behind the shield of a character. You know, it's like a protective wall. True acting is is usually genuinely feeling whatever your character is supposed to be feeling in the moment. Of course, having this mask makes it a little bit safer. So. I thought that was sort of funny because, you know, on set there aren't as many people as it's very different than public speaking. It's very different than public speaking as yourself. It's very different than social situations. For me, public speaking is never anything I get anxious about. I've, I've had fans and followers ask me questions like, oh, how do you get prepared for uh, speaking at a convention or on a panel at a con? Like, how do you deal with stage fright? And I'm like, I don't actually have stage fright because there's still this barrier. It's still somewhat rehearsed. I could be candid, of course, but, you know, it's still something that's very planned. And there's this barrier between me and the audience. When I'm on stage, there's still like this invisible wall of protection. And as soon as my career started going really well and I was in the public eye, my skin picking got really bad. Like I was always, I always picked up my cuticles and I was always a nail biter. But the skin picking on my legs got really, really bad to the point where I remember my first American red carpet for the Streamy Awards. I was so nervous and I skin picked so badly the night before that I had to put makeup on my legs. I had this aerosol makeup and it looked like I murdered a fucking Oompa Loompa in the hotel bathroom and I like ruined one of the towels. I ended up having to pay for it because I was like panicking and trying to cover all the marks and scars on my legs. So it was almost like a way of not allowing myself to just have good things in my life and to tear myself down or bring myself down. No one on the red carpet was the wiser. Everyone probably assumed that Natasha was doing great, picture perfect even, but she was crying out for help. And it shouldn't take an extreme crisis to have someone take you seriously. And I think what's really frustrating as someone who's perceived as high functioning and successful on the outside, I was unable to receive mental health care until I was at a point where there was suicidal ideation, severe panic attacks, physical symptoms. What thoughts are going through your mind when you're skin picking? Through talk therapy, I've learned a little bit more about my triggers for skin picking. But because it is part of the OCD spectrum, a lot of it is just truly a compulsion that I can't control. And some people believe it's it's slightly linked to, you know, body dysmorphia, seeing an imperfection, trying to quote unquote fix it. And then because of the OCD getting caught in a cycle, well, then you're now picking at things that aren't really there or just making things worse. And it's like, logically, you know, it's going to make things worse if you dig out that ingrown hair, but you do it anyway. I actually remember the very first time I really started getting into these cycles where it's like you just lose time, you lose two hours. 
uh, it was about 2015. And, and through talk therapy, I did realize that there was like a direct correlation between being in the public eye. So I have two triggers for skin picking. I think one is like extreme anxiety and boredom, you know, when my brain is very hyperactive. So for me, the ADHD is less of a, an inability to focus. I mean, sometimes I can't focus. You either get hyper fixated on something or hyper focused, or I have way too many ideas buzzing around in my head and I need to actually be multitasking and doing multiple things at a time. By the summer of 2018, her skin picking was getting really bad and she started looking for another therapist. I really went with my gut and I went with the person who felt the best and who was LGBTQ friendly, who, you know, specialized in things that I wanted to work on. I saw them every week for about two and a half years, and it was one of the best things I could have done. Therapy's hard. And at that time, when I started seeing my therapist, I actually wasn't in a place of crisis. Life was going quite well for me, but I think sometimes that's the best time to start therapy because you actually have the energy to dive into your childhood, to dive into your past, to actually process things. Things for Natasha were going pretty well. She was working, going to therapy, in a relationship, you know, just living life. But then the pandemic hit. In summer 2020 with the pandemic and and just the sort of mourning the loss of my life that was, I think, um, and just going through different life transitions and, and starting to rehash certain traumas from childhood and things like that, to, you know, having time to, to think about it, I, I did end up. Uh, in a place of crisis again. How has the pandemic influenced your anxiety? The pandemic has definitely piqued my anxiety and my depression. And it's, you know, it's one or the other. I joked that I'm either like constantly having like anxiety induced IBS or like depression constipation. But I think that's, that's true for everyone right now. Being someone who's empathetic, seeing what's happening in the world, you know, feeling a sense of social responsibility and trying to think about others, but also trying to survive and think of, you know, myself and my loved ones in terms of career worries, financial worries feeling like you're failing, also having way too much time on your hands to think about things. My skin picking, as I said, has gotten much worse during this this time. Practicing gratitude is something that I've really found helpful and I've really taken away from this time. So, and I, I don't mean to get all live, laugh, love on people, you know, feelings are valid and I don't want to get all like corny or like hashtag blessed on people because, you know, I think a lot of that is, is quite false for people. But I will say that the actual true practice of gratitude has been very, very helpful in this time in counting really, really small blessings, you know, whatever you believe, blessings, whatever, good luck, whatever, positive little joys in your life, taking time to just look at that and be like, I'm not okay. I'm not okay right now. I'm not great, but I will get better. There will be better days ahead. And like, here are a number of good things that I have right now. So I'm grateful that I still have a roof over my head and the landlord who's like being very patient with me and not evicting me. I'm grateful that I don't have COVID and that my immediate family does not have COVID that I have my physical health, more or less. I'm grateful to live in a country with free healthcare. You know, I am grateful for the following that I have in the community that I built. I'm grateful for my partner who's so supportive of my mental health. You know, so taking stock of those little things and asking yourself a question, even if it's just once a week, and it's like, what made me smile this week? What do I like about myself this week? Those are practices that I've really gotten into during this time. Ooh, gratitude list. I know this one. Let's see. I am grateful for my parents, my siblings, and my friends that I can call when I'm feeling down. 
There's my dog, Maisie, with her big ears and fluffy little butt. My Starbucks barista. My AMC A-list membership. Oh, and breakfast burritos, even the bad ones. I could keep going, but I'm feeling so much better already. So the excoriation disorder has gotten quite worse in isolation and quarantine because I have less to do and I'm alone and uh, I'm not on camera because, you know, before I would have to to film something, I, I would allow myself to control my compulsions a little bit better because I knew that I had to be on camera and I had to look perfect. Eventually, Natasha went and saw a specialist. They finally properly diagnosed me to be on the OCD spectrum. Um, so I have dermatillomania or, or excoriation disorder, which is a subsection of OCD, which people understand that now. The psychiatrist who misdiagnosed me saw it as a form of self-harm. And the thing is, it's not because self-harm is often done in a place where people can see it. It's done to feel something, to feel that pain. It's done for attention sometimes. It's, it's done to, to feel alive. Skin picking and excoriation disorder is very isolating. It's very shameful. It's often done in places where people can't see it. It's often something shameful that you hide. It's a method of self-regulation and self-soothing, but it's also very much a compulsion. So that's why people now understand that it's a subsection of OCD. Natasha is now on the road to getting help for her skin picking disorder. Although it's a wait list, she's happy that her Canadian healthcare will allow her to get support. So then they referred me to a special skin picking clinic, which is, I'm very lucky to live in Toronto. And uh, we have one of the best skin picking clinics in North America here that's specifically just for that. I am currently on a wait list still. So that is the only problem is, you know, there are wait lists here, but it's going to be covered by the government. So I'm very grateful for that. Eventually I learned that, yeah, one of my triggers is uh, positive things as well. People always commented on how nice my skin was. And I was very lucky. I never had acne. I was blessed with very, very nice skin. And people would say, wow, you have such perfect skin. You have such perfect skin. You know, it's like barely even a freckle. And I you know, I'm half Greek and I I tan really well. And so it was always this perfect smooth skin. And, you know, I'd wear short skirts or shorts and things like that. Um, And now I can't. It's like I completely permanently mutilated or scarred my own body. I have no one to blame but myself. It's fucked up. And there's, as I said, there's a lot of shame around it. It's very isolating. I only kind of, quote unquote, came out with excoriation disorder when I finally received my proper diagnosis. But uh, even just this summer upon posting more about mental health on Instagram, uh, building community and reflecting, having time to reflect, I was finally able to talk about it. And and finding a friend who talked about it as well and was talking about their excoriation disorder in their artwork, that was very helpful for me, just seeing someone else publicly speak about it because it's really, really not talked about. And it's, as I said, very, very, very shameful. On a scale of one to 10, 10 being like the most anxious you've ever felt, where would you say you are like on a day-to-day basis? On a scale of one to 10, I would say my daily anxiety currently is like a seven, maybe. I mean, obviously this is an extraordinary time. And I think everyone, even people who don't clinically suffer from anxiety, I think everyone's feeling uh, pretty, pretty tense right now. Um You know, but for most of the time, I would say it fluctuates throughout the day. Something can spark it. Most of the time, I think, appear, at least on the outside, pretty calm. Can you try to walk me through, like, what a panic attack feels like to you? It's very difficult for me to describe what my panic attacks feel like, particularly because on the outside, I look like I'm together. But inside, I am fearful. Sometimes it results in tears. Uh, Sometimes it results in a very fast heartbeat. So for me, having a distraction, you know, turning on a podcast or some noise in the background, calling a friend, going out for a walk, changing my environment, those things are very helpful for me. And I need to take better note of what it's like when I'm experiencing them. But of course, when you're feeling frightened and you're in a period of crisis, it's hard to then remove yourself and disassociate and be like, okay, what symptoms am I experiencing right now? So it's very difficult for me to describe what a panic attack is like, but it's certainly not 
what I think is often depicted on on screens, you know, fictional characters having panic attacks. I'm not like hyperventilating and it's it's very, very internal for me. What about just general anxiety? Like, do you get hot? Do you, does it feel like someone's, like for me, it feels like someone is stepping on my chest. For me, I just feel very restless. There's an excess of energy when I'm experiencing anxiety uh, or panicking. I feel very restless. I feel like I just can't relax. I feel like I can't focus on one thing. I need to like get up and move. And it's sort of like part of this is also something I don't want to completely squash because it's also part of being a creative person and an intellectual. And part of it is like, I always have a million ideas at once, but when it's 3.30 in the morning and you're trying to sleep, then it's it's very frustrating. Or sometimes anxiety is like replaying old scenarios obsessively over and over and over again. That's also part of being on the OCD spectrum is intrusive negative thought patterns. So, you know, you'll have obsessive negative thought patterns and then compulsively think about them over and over again to the point where you can't distract yourself from it. Through talk therapy, through meditation, through yoga, I've really found that I'm more able to live in the present moment. And it's certainly gotten much, much better because I think I was often living either in the past or the future. What does your inner voice say to you? It's funny because I wrote a children's book that I really want to get published, but apparently nobody wants rhyming books these days. Um, It does rhyme. It's in limerick form, but it's about a little girl who has a monster who lives in her head. And so I often personify these things as a little monster who lives in my head. So that's the other thing is like learning to see the positive in the mental health issues that actually make me unique or make me creative or make me successful, whatever that means, you know, success. <laughs> what is that? I mean, now I do not feel that way, but you know, success can mean a number of different things. It's like, well, I have a really positive relationship that's really healthy and loving and communicative and wonderful. And even though that's not something that was on my list of goals and I feel like my career is going terribly right now, I still have to look at that as a form of success, you know? Is there anything you feel like I haven't asked you that you want to talk about? I do think that people do behave differently when they are experiencing a mental health crisis. Anxiety and depression can certainly influence the way we interact with other people. And so the more we just talk about it, we normalize these struggles and we have more understanding of them as well. I think it'll be easier for folks to move forward. And I think we just need to like heal collectively. That is something that I'm working on doing. And I do find like the more I personally heal and the nicer I am to myself, the more I have positive experiences with others as well. And that was Natasha Negavanlis in early 2021. That's right. I recorded this a while ago before the show even had a name. Let's check in with Natasha to see how she's doing now. So about a month after we spoke, I very tragically experienced the deaths of both a close friend and my grandfather who passed away within a few weeks of each other. I was actually watching my friend's funeral on Zoom in the passenger seat in a car on the way to say goodbye to my grandfather. So needless to say, 2021 was a very strange year and could not have predicted any of that. Did not help with my body-focused repetitive behaviors or skin picking at all, but luckily my spot on the wait list at the skin picking clinic came up shortly after. So I was able to join a support group. I did find meeting other people with the same disorder and just having peer support to be really wonderful. I'm still in touch with folks from the group over, over a year later now. Just having people to talk to to about it and finding community and finding online resources has really helped me heal. So although I'm not fully healed, I do think I'm slowly improving with each day. And um, I think just, yeah, the ability to check in with friends helps the most. And talking is always the first and best step, I think, to any mental health disorder. And that's why I think this podcast is is so important. And I'm, I'm so grateful that I got to be one of the first guests. We've got to talk about it and, and really end that stigma and know that it is it is okay to not be okay. Amen to that. You can find Natasha on social media at Nat Vanless, and she hosts a podcast called Vanless Presents. Can you do me a small favor? 
Make sure to subscribe to this podcast wherever you subject yourself to it. And if you want unlimited Gilly points, leave a five-star review. Until next time, be kind to yourself. His name is Gil. And he's mentally ill. Mentally Gil is executive produced and hosted by me, Gil Kruger. Executive produced by Zach Stewart Pontier. Produced and edited by Melissa DeMonts and Diane Kang of Diamond Emprint Productions. Post-production sound by Sam Baer. Theme song and ad break music by Austin Archer. This has been a Best Regards Media production. Best Regards.